and Economic Development Committee. This is a public meeting and, and members of the public and press are permitted to report on the proceedings. Reporting includes filming, photography, making an audio re recording and providing commentary on proceedings. Please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you are deemed to have given your consent to be filmed or recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premise must be evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. All emergency escape routes are clearly signed and once you have left the building the assembly point is in the high street opposite the guild hall members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphones when speaking so first of all do we have any appointments to of substitutes there are no, and, no substitutes chair and i think there's no apologies either and declarations of interest. No. Yes. Um, on um, item five, I chair the Arches project. Okay. Um, public participation. There's none, Chair. There's none. And the minutes from the last meeting. So um, the meeting was held on the 14th of March and um, we'll go um, page by page. So page one, page two, page three and page four. And are you uh, content that I sign them as a, as a record? Yeah. So. Um, first of all, we come to the Archers and Worcester Legacy pro Project, which I think um, Shane is going to introduce. Uh, Elaine's going to speak. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Councillors. Uh, um, members will be familiar with the Archers Project. This was a, a £3 million project, uh, which included Arts Council funding to convert five arches under the railway lines and uh, a number of other uh, capital works associated with that, but also to run a series of festivals and carry out some participative work. There's a whole range of things and members, of course, will have participated in and enjoyed the festivals over the last couple of years and, and may or may not know that one of the arches, well, you know, they're all converted and complete, but uh, one of them is now occupied as well with the tenant in situ. So we've made good progress against all of that. Now, one of the things which we're required to do under the project is to is to develop a legacy plan and as part of the work the, the partners have been discussing how we might do that and an opportunity has arisen through the work that seven arts are doing an application to become a preferred uh, operator for the uh, arts council that attracts significant investment which will come into the city through seven arts and we have an opportunity to, to support and contribute to that as we go forward in the first instance, one of the proposals included in the submission is for a community producer, a, a, a person to work with local communities to develop ongoing festival work and a number of other activities. And we have an we have the um, members will recall that in the budget we put aside fifty thousand pounds for arts and culture to support the arts and culture strategy. Now, we're a little bit ahead of the strategy publication, but nonetheless, the reserve has been created and would be available for it to help us in terms of making some financial commitment to this particular work. So that's the proposal within the report. Now, Elaine Knight from Seven Arts has kindly agreed to come along and say a little bit more about what the, what the application involves and what the role might involve, and also some of the ongoing legacy work uh, I think I've got that right, Elaine, in terms of what you're going to present. So if members are content, I'm happy to hand over to Elaine to take us through that. I need to ask those on this side to do a, do a 180 degrees so that you can see the screen behind. 
Thank you, Shane. Um, so, yeah, first of all, um, an apology. My colleague David Edmonds was supposed to be here tonight. He's the artistic uh, director of the festivals, but he's got COVID, so I told him to stay at home because I didn't think we'd, um, we all want to go home with COVID. So, unfortunately, you've just got me for the next 10 minutes, although I have got a couple of films to show you which come from the partners and the um, participants that will talk about the impact of the project so far. Right, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, oops, I'm Isn't that working now? We've tested it and it. Am I put, do I need to stand up or point at something else? If you want to go on to the next slide, I'll do that next slide, please. Thank you. So um, I was going to recap on um, where we're at, um, because if we're going to talk about legacy. I thought it was important just to recap on where we're at, but Shane's already kind of mentioned that. So we had um, in 2019, Worcester was one of five cities to be awarded cultural development funding, which was to unlock econom economic growth through culture and creativity. And it's brought four and a half million pound into the city, partly through the DCMS and partly through other match funding. It was due to finish in 2000 and, well, 2022, just gone in March, but that's obviously been extended a year, mainly because of COVID. And um, as Shane mentioned, it was to restore the Victorian arches, uh, create a new festivals hub, to create a skills development program and to create a new destination for the city. Please. So in terms of legacy plans, um, We've worked over the last three years and we've engaged with 140,000 audience members. We've engaged um, 1,000 members of the community as participants. We've worked with uh, 100 volunteers and we've created 10 jobs. And as part of the legacy plan, Seven Arts has applied to Arts Council to become a national portfolio organisation, which if successful would bring a, four, a further £400,000 a year for the next three years into the city to help us develop and evolve the festival's programme. The programme we've designed reflects the external evaluation that Annabel Jackson has undertaken and will include um, Light Night, which is about bringing world-class culture into the city through commissioning artists to work with local communities to create something for and with Worcester. The Rising, which is a programme curated and programmed for young adults aged 18 to 30. A new festival called Catapult which is about supporting emerging artists working in outdoor arts to work with the community festivals, increasing their capacity and grow artistic ambition, uh, working with them to help fundraise and broaden their reach. Community engagement projects, which will build on the participatory cultural engagement opportunities that we've had over the last three years and to work with volunteers, um, helping them to kind of connect back to their communities. As a commitment to the project, Seven Arts has already extended David Edmund's contract to ensure continuity between the two projects. And as Shane has already mentioned, as part of the delivery team, we have included a community producer role who will work with local communities to support the community engagement and working with the volunteers and the community festivals. So to give you a flavour of what they might be able to, what, what they'll be doing, I'm going to give you some examples of what's happened over the past three years. Um, and I'm going to start with a film. Um, as this uh, probably gives you a better idea than me just talking. Um, so this is a film from the same but different festival that took place last July. And this is a satellite project working in uh, KGV and the Horizon Hubs. Thank you. 
So that's just one way that we can engage with the community. Another way was um, during Light Night 2021, we worked with Lippard Grange Primary School and they were instrumental in how the work developed. And for those of you who saw it at the Old Palace, you will know that the kind of the children were kind of centre to the new piece of artwork, which was then obviously very distinctive to Worcester. And also as part of Light Night 2021, you may remember that the Guild Hall, the projection onto the Guild Hall, which used the many different guilds of the city. So that's another way of just making the work distinctive and unique to Worcester. Um, I suppose our philosophy has always been not to duplicate anything that already exists in the city, but to fill the gaps. And before we started our festivals programme, the research we undertook showed that there were quite a lot of young adults aged 18 to 30 that felt there wasn't anything cultural wise for them in the city. So we've been working with them to create a festival specifically for that age group. Um, there is a group of 14 young adults that have been working with us over the last few months and will continue to work with us up until October. And then there will be a festival that is specifically aimed at that age group. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is another short film. So we've been working uh, as part of Light Night last year in Ronxwood, Dines Green and Warden. And the children from the primary schools created a new lullaby, which was then um, uh, presented and uh, played as part of um, a community lit bike ride around those three communities and was another satellite project which linked back into Light Night. As I said, we've worked with some of the community festivals in the city um, and over the last three years we've worked specifically with four, uh, mainly to raise ambition, to develop skills and broaden reach. Um, so those are some of the training that we've undertaken with the, the, the community festivals. And I'm just going to talk about a little bit about the four festivals that we've uh, been working with and what we've managed to do over the last three years. So if we just go on to the next slide, please. So we've worked with Worcester Mellor. Um, I think some of you were at the Worcester Mellor launch a couple of months ago. So we've re-established a Mellor for Worcester that had been dormant for many years. We've helped them set up as an independent organisation. We worked with them to successfully bring in £15,000 from the Arts Council and a similar amount from other funding sources. They've created a new film which captures the voices of the first settlers to Worcester, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And they're currently working with the NHS to create a more permanent memorial for those most affected by, uh, by COVID, which will be housed up at the hospital. So, that's, yep, thank you. <laughs> Love the Arbo is another one. This is a community um, light festival based in the Arboretum. 
the main thing we've done with this organisation is broker new partnerships. We've uh, brokered a partnership between the University of Worcester, um, creating new opportunities for students to create work for the festival, to put, be able to put something on their CV for site-specific um, commissions, and we've established links with local businesses. Our next festival is Worcester Music Festival. This is obviously a well-established festival in the city. Um, but what we've done with them is we've uh, worked with them on their funding application to Arts Council, which has recently been successful and will bring in £29,000 into the city. Um, and this is to establish um, a new genre of music, which the festival doesn't currently deliver around experimental music. It's to work with St Swithin's Church to create that and establish it as a new uh, music venue in the city. Um, it's to deliver a year long programme of workshops and performances, which um, the festival doesn't normally do. Normally it's a one year uh, fest oh, oh, a festival once a year um, and it should attract new audiences into Worcester um, from across the region. And then our final festival um, is Worcester Carnival. Um, and we've been encouraging them to think a little bit about the, uh, the uh, environmental impact uh, the parade has. So we've been piloting a new approach with them around working with an artist who can develop a non-fossil fueled float, which is environmentally friendly. And in the autumn, we'll be putting in an application to Arts Council to develop more workshops over the coming year. And then I think Shane's already mentioned this. Um, so we're, we're asking the City Council if they would kindly contribute £20,000 towards the community producer's role. That role will be um, working in the communities, um, uh, kind of working with the community festivals, leading on community engagement projects, managing the volunteers. Um, and uh, the application we will know to Arts Council will know whether that's successful in October. And obviously, all of this would start from April 2023 when the Arches projects conclude. And happy to take any questions if I can answer them. Thank you for that, Elaine. Um, I'm really glad to see that uh, every part of the city is involved, not just, um, and uh, particularly, I'm uh, really glad that uh, Lippard, Lippard Grange. Um, primary school. I'm a, I'm a governor there, and uh, I'm really glad that uh, they were involved in the lighting up of the big old bishop's palace and that sort of thing. And it's really, it's really um, that uh, it's a whole of the city gets involved. So, uh, can can you questions, please? No. No. Adrian? Well, can you tell us more about this um, uh, NOP status? I don't really understand yeah. what it's for. Yes, yeah, so, so typoed, isn't it? Um, the National Portfolio yeah. Organisation. Yep, so Arts Council um, have a number of organisations across the country they fund on a regular basis, and they're called National Portfolio Organisations. Um, what it does is secure funding for three years. Um, otherwise, it's a case of applying every year for funding. So it gives us some stability and to be able to plan kind of ahead. Um, so it's an application process. The application's in at the moment and uh, decisions will be made over the coming months. What does it do? It I mean, you're going to get a community producer. So there will be a whole team of, there will be a delivery, I mean, is it, sorry. Does this mean, is it, is it more festivals? Is it more this, more that? What is, 400,000 is a lot of money to get every year. So to pay some money to do something. So, okay, so it, it's to, to do the things that we talked about at the beginning. So it's to bring light night in on a regular basis, on a yearly basis. It's to have the rising on a yearly basis. It's to develop the new festival catapult it's to work with community festivals, it's to do some engagement projects and to work with volunteers. Right, so and I, a delivery team to manage that. So I suppose my question, if you don't mind, Chair, then is, is on the back of that, is, is it, that all feels quite bespoke because it's stuff that has already been happening and it's going to continue to happen. Um, how far is it going to contribute new material? So every time we do a festival, whilst it might have the same name, there will be new content. So if we're commissioning new work for Light Nights, it will be new artists with new work that will work with new groups. 
rather we won't we don't um, present the same work twice. So everything will always be we might one we we may continue working with the same festivals. You you might say to us, could we work with different community festivals? That's a conversation that we would have nearer the time. Um, we've tried to work with um, areas of the city that don't kind of aren't based in the city centres. But again, if you know, we would take your lead on where you might want us to work at the moment. None of that bit is prescriptive. The kind of the overarching aims of what we want to do is kind of, as I say, evolved out of the evaluation. But where some of that happens is yet to be decided. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was uh, really interesting. I got, yeah, I was really um, I, I struck by the positivity, which is, is great. Um, the one thing that I wanted to try and explore a little bit more of, if we could, is you know. When you reach out to communities like my own, for example, or in other parts of the city, you know, to what extent? I mean, culture is, is kind of an organic thing. Uh, now, is, are, you know, to what extent are the communities going to be encouraged to sort of take ownership of what's going kind of going on here? So, part of Arts Council's new strategy is around exactly that, about the, the um, communities having an input into what they want. I mean, we'd obviously need to frame it within, you know, if, if we've got funding from Arts Council to deliver sort of a light night project, it will need to be framed within that context as opposed to, I don't know, doing something in, in a theatre that has no relevance to that. But they will be part of those conversations around um, how we evolve those projects. Um, and we will also work with quite a lot of we probably we would more we would work with partners that will broker those relationships because we always find that partners have those built up trust and they those relationships with the community well we, so we would work with, so in the past we've worked with the Worcester Community Trust quite a lot we work with schools because they have you know that that relationship with the parents and those pupils Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. That's great. Um, I'm just wondering, because obviously the security of this funding is really good, but if you don't get it, are there any other sources yep. that you could pay for? So we, we have a list of other sources of funding that um, as, we, as soon as we know in October whether we're going to get NPO or not from Arts Council, that we will have applications ready to go to other funding. What we've done is obviously planned... Um, uh, a programme based on the evaluation so we have all of that work ready and uh, if uh, Arts Council isn't successful a we can go to them for project grants which is just a one year obviously funding that we'll need to keep renewing there are three or four other pots that we can apply for so we will I'm pretty sure we will be doing something wherever the funding comes from and some of these projects can happen without you know masses of funding so there will be opportunities to do that that really has legs um, and uh, it's a really good project that um, maybe for years to come um, we can see the sort of the um, the way how this project can can evolve and uh, and actually um, can uh, can involve the whole of the city and not just certain parts so i think this is a real a real legacy so and um, so the the committee so the recommendation is that the committee allocates twenty thousand pounds from the arts and cultural strategy implement implementation fund to support the arches worcester legacy as part of the seven arts npo status so, am I, am I, do I have everyone in favour? Thank you. Thank you for that, Elaine. Thank you very much. So, the hearts and cultural strategy next, which I think is um, Helen. Thanks, Chair. Um, evening, everybody. Um, so, the recommendation for this report is that members note the contents of this report, updating on progress with the Worcester Arts and Culture Strategy. As we know, and as we've just heard, the Arts and Culture Strategy, uh, the cultural offer in Worcester is wide-ranging, vibrant and exciting, and it's delivered by a sector that continues to innovate and develop. We've 
we've had this weekend the Algar Festival. Um, we've just had the Worcester Music Festival is going to be back in September. There's a huge programme of arts events in the city um, each year, and, and this year is going to be no exception. Um, live performance venues like Huntingdon Hall, the Mars Bar, the Swan Theatre and Paradiddles host grassroots and big name artists in the city, as well as comedy and experimental work. We've got a fantastic provision for youth music and arts with several amazing youth theatres such as Worcester Theatre Makers, Worcester Rep and more. Um, members agreed uh, to commission an arts and cultural strategy to acknowledge and champion the Worcester arts scene from a council perspective, as well as identify opportunities for growth and development. And we commissioned consultancy firm event festivals and events international last august 2021 to support the development of the strategy a total of 445 people have been engaged in consultation um, and that's through surveys workshops interviews and discussion groups over a significant period of time last year um, this report as i said seeks to update on progress in the creation of the strategy and sets out next steps ahead of adoption um, I'm going to summarise now the draft strategy aims and objectives. There are four key aims and 12 objectives. So, so the first um, key aim is to provide arts and cultural leadership for the city, which will include things like increasing Worcester's influence within the wider region, encouraging and empowering the sector to deliver ambitious creative projects, developing and nurturing creative networks in the city to avoid people from, uh, to, to, to try and deter people from working in silos, and encourage everybody to achieve more. The second aim is to develop our capacity. So we'll be looking to assist the sector in securing funding, providing advice and advocacy to, um, to encourage ambition um, and employment opportunities, and also to acknowledge the importance of our fantastic art volunteers, without whom much of the programme in the city would not happen. The third aim is to improve the lives of our communities and widen participation. We're looking to enable more people of all ages to take part in arts and cultural activities, we're looking to enrich the lives of our residents and visitors and we want to celebrate Worcester's unique creative offer. We're also seeking to um, create quality employment opportunities. And then finally, the fourth aim is to grow our audiences. We want to shout about the arts and the culture and um, activity in the city. We want to promote creative and cultural activities to residents and visitors. And we want to develop a regional reputation for the art that attracts visitors to the city from outside the city to event, attend events and performances. The strategy will be supported by a delivery plan and that will be developed throughout the consultation process which we're about to begin and it will set out short medium and long-term plans for delivery of the objectives of the strategy so the next steps um, the draft strategy will now undergo a period of consultation this will involve a survey um, which will be carried out in person and online we want to make sure that it's accessible to people so that they don't have to have an internet connection to fill it in and um, there'll be printed copies available as well as online versions and that will be widely shared um, we're going to seek the views of members, residents, venues, arts and cultural practitioners and arts and cultural audiences. And we're going to work with the arts and creative scene to make sure that that message is spread and that that, that strategy is seen as widely as possible. We're going to collect that feedback between June and, and September this year. Um, and there will be an updated report brought to the October PED committee meeting based on that feedback. Um, you've all received a copy of the draft strategy with the papers today. Um, and um, I mean that's the end of my report. If there's any feedback at this stage on on the report, I'm happy to hear it. Although I would note that obviously there will be a strategy um, consultation process. So if it's really detailed, it might be best to put it through that that process to make sure it's really captured. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Chair. Certainly. To create this um, arts and arts and culture strategy, and. Um, I certainly welcome now the consultation stage. So, Jill. Thank you, Chair. Um, your consultation, I wonder, is there any information on, on how you will conduct that? And I mean, the aims of having it paper and online, great. But exactly how do we get people who perhaps never have contributed to do so? Thanks. Um, we, um, it's, it's going to be really important, like you say, to make sure that we're getting as many views as possible. Um, the, there will be a survey which is based on a number of set questions with quite, um, a lot of them will be quite um, prescriptive answers. So kind of views about how people are using services, how people are accessing the arts currently. Um, but there will also be free text opportunities for people to be able to express um, their views as well um, more, more freely. Um, in terms of how we will engage with the public, um, there'll be um, some promotion of the survey. Um, so whether that's 
online um, through Facebook advertising or social media advertising and um, through City Life as well, our, our residence magazine that goes through the doors of 43,000 homes. Um, it will also um, go, uh, as I say, paper copies. We want to get those into the into the surveys, uh, into the venues to make sure that people are actually accessing that and we'll have um, QR codes as well so that people can scan them. Um, in terms of engaging with people who don't currently engage with the arts scene um, that's 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 general sort of residence i suppose so that would be through city life and the um, my worcester communication channels as well so is city life forty three thousand households okay what proportion of that is the total um, that's that's all the households. So that's um, that City Life magazine is. Um, I've never seen it. Uh, it's a quarterly magazine that the city council produces. Right. Um, and so it, um, I need. To, I don't know the offhand the next date of it, but it, there's one each season, um, and it's printed and published and, and put through every single household, pretty much. I mean, Eighteen months never had one, so. <laughs> we, well, I mean, on a, on a side note, then um, we need to check your address and make sure that it's being delivered to you. Um, I am sure also. Um, Elaine as well, some of the uh, some of the participants of the um, um, the the lights, the festivals and things we've we've had, particularly in the areas where we've had, can also be consulted as well. Yes, we can certainly share that with our database and on on our social media. So yeah, we we will we will do that automatically once we've kind of got a link, which I know Helen's going to send us at some point soon. And could I just ask one more question? Yep. How will we know the extent to which that consultation has been successful in involving people? Um, I think the um, the publication of the sort of next iteration of the strategy needs to factor in that in the same way that this one references the engagement that took place in the first place. I think the um, the next strategy will have a section that says about the consultation and how that's factored in. And obviously, consultation and, and feedback on the strategy, you know, we, until we get it, we don't know what that's going to look like. So how we can integrate that into the strategy, I don't know. Uh, that wasn't quite the question, sorry. Uh, how will we know that our strategy to engage people who don't normally turn up to the theatre and pick up a form, for example, how will we know whether or not we've managed to successfully reach out to people? That was my question. I think it will come down to the questions that we ask about demographics and, and knowing what we know about how people respond. I mean, I'm, I must admit, I'm not a, a consultation sort of expert, um, but it, it won't be me leading that aspect. So um, we'll make sure that we were able to, to answer that question through the consultation. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Warwick and his team will be heavily involved as well. So uh, they're, and, and they're very, very, very well adverse to, um, to doing that this sort of communication and that sort of thing so yep simon and then simon yep uh yeah i wanted to ask about consultation as well um obviously you know consultation is very important in in developing any strategy but i'm just curious as to know how the proposed consultation this year is going to differ from the consultation which happened last year, which seems to me to have been on pretty much the same issue. Uh, but bearing in mind, I, I imagine it's a fairly expensive process to, to set up. Um, thanks, Mum. Um, the, um, the, the consultation that went into the development of the strategy um, was was very open-ended it was it was chaired by the consultants that we um, commissioned to, to support the development um, and it involved um, focus groups and um, sort of lots of free talking free discussion and lots of kind of almost um, there was one session which had um, post-it notes and, and everything was sort of very much people could just put their own mind down onto paper the next stage of the consultation will be looking at the strategy itself um, so we want people to be able to, to see the strategy and then answer specific questions about it. So things like, um, does, does this represent your experience of the arts in Worcester? You know, here's a list of festivals. Are these the kind of, are these the kind of festivals that you're going to? That, that sort of um, feedback. So it will be more specific. Um, it, it can't cost lots of money because we haven't got a huge budget for this. 
Um, but but actually that we can do an awful lot with um, with very little budget in terms of engaging with the community and, and, and as, as Councillor Hodgson just mentioned we've got really good links within the community um, already so we'll be utilising those and Seven Arts will be sharing it with their groups and, and all of those aspects won't cost us anything because it will be through their existing mailing lists so um, I'm comfortable that we can we can engage with an awful lot of people and it'll just be more specific and more honed towards actually responding to this document rather than a, a free text kind of give us your thoughts. Simon. Thanks Chair. It's building on the previous questions really about consultation engagement. I wondered about visitors to the city and how their views would be captured as part of that, whether there'd be a physical presence. We talked about online and paper, but I'm thinking as people are getting much more confident they're going out to events now, how do we capture their views? Will there be a sort of in-person presence at some of those events now? those conversations with people to really get under the, under, the, under the hood of what they'd like to see in the city, maybe more or less of, etc. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I um, I can't answer that because um, I won't be leading that aspect of the consultation, um, but I'll definitely I'll make sure that it's noted as a good idea. Um, we've, we have talked about having a, pres a presence in an empty shop, for example, and um, we've used before the, the pod in Crown Gate, which is a, a community space that people can pop up in. So. And I'll make sure that that's included um, as a suggestion in the plan. Because, of course, the um, Worcester Festival will be actually part of, in December, in um, August, will be in, in the city. So it's an ideal time to, um, to make sure it does happen. Yeah. Um, Adrian and then um, Neil. Um, thanks, Chair. The... Um... I was trying to recall how um, how much the strategy consultancy job cost, um, but I, I couldn't see it immediately in the last set of minutes. So perhaps you could remind me. But um, clearly, this next stage um, is is going to require city council staff to do the work. Well, are we sure that we've got the capacity to do that within the time frame that you're talking about? Um, because it would be good not to let this drift. Yeah, thanks. Um, the, um, the budget for the, the first stage was £15,000, um, which was spent. There is a little bit of money left over from um, a different budget. Yeah. Um, the, um, in terms of the capacity of the team, I'd, 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 I'd probably have to defer that question but I mean certainly it's a commitment from the team to um, to deliver this on by October and to consult on it fully across the summer so um, that's that's probably as much as I can answer at this stage thank you chair um, in uh, 2013 there was a big chocolate festival in Worcester City and then it never happened again um, I still think think about it and said, <laughs> um, it was great and then it didn't happen my question is um, well two questions can it happen again and second question is who has final say so once this consultation is finished and we as councillors and the public pitch in with their ideas who sifts through those ideas and says we're going to do the chocolate festival again we're going to do this again and you know how do you narrow it down and say going to give it the green light or who gives it the green light because I am still bereft. <laughs> the next stage, of, so all of the detail that comes together from the consultancy will form an action plan for us on what we want to do short term, medium term and long term. And that will include things like if there's enough people that are suggesting that your chocolate festival um, could be a hit and there's a demand for it, then that could potentially form one of the actions within the action plan. So it. it the, the next stage is very much focused about actually doing rather than just talking about the strategy. It's what we are going to do to achieve these outputs. And that may be a chocolate um, festival. It may be uh, another light festival. It may be um, a, a whole programme around primary schools. It's whatever the demand proves to us that we need to do to move these things on. So potentially, yeah. Please respond to the consultation and include your requirement for a chocolate festival. And we'll certainly uh, consider it as part of our action plan moving forward.
Recommendation is that members note the contents of the report, updating on progress with the um, Worcester Arts and Cultural Strategy. And um, let's hope uh, we can provide the chocolate uh, festival. So, Elaine, in, please note. <laughs> So, uh, oh, so, uh, do we note that? So, finally, then, annual and quarter four performance um, report for 2021-22. Um, Shane, is, are, you produce, are you reporting on this? Thank you, Chair. Only in the sense that uh, I'm ultimately responsible for the report being produced. There are colleagues with us tonight who should be able to answer any detailed questions that members may have. Um, this is the first report for this new um, uh, new financial year, and uh, we have a, a few updates in terms of some of the dates which need to come back to a future committee for agreed. So some of those which are currently sitting as red will, will turn into a, a green or an amber as we reset the, the project timelines. There are sufficient, I think, detailed notes in respect of the, of, of the report, but any comments or observations or questions? We'll do our best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just two questions. Um, how, what's the progress with the strategic play consultant is the first question. And if I can just leap on to the second question, it's just a, a tangential one. Um, <laughs> I remember noting from last meeting that some of, the, some of the targets were very, very precise. And I can see that the museum membership, sorry, museum footfall number we've slipped by 30 but we're marking that as a red which mm. i think given the current circumstances it's not actually a bad achievement <laughs> yes really i certainly also noted that as well so um sean through you chair yes the um update on the strategic play area assessment is that the brief to the consultants needs to go live, the procurement needs to go live, and we need to consult with the chair and vice chair of this committee before we do that. So we, we know it's a priority and we're conscious of the, again, the target we've set ourselves on that one. So we'll be bringing that draft brief to chair and vice chair for signing off very shortly. Adrian, oh, sorry, James, Carrot and Adrian. Uh, chair, thank you. Um, if I may, uh, city centre footfall and for that matter, dwell time is it? We've, we've spoken about this on a number of occasions in di different contexts and so forth. And I acknowledge the fact that the figures are of necessity somewhat sort of outdated. But much of what we've spoken about this evening, arts and culture, getting people into the city centre, um, improving the experience of Worcester City Centre would kind of inevitably, one would hope, have an uptick on those figures. Um, the, but the key point is, is to me, is where the report notes that this appears to be in line with other places, how sort of rigorously are the comparator places sort of, you know, are we sort of examining this on a, on a fairly rigorous basis? I wonder where we sit, you know, in comparison with similar sort of um, cities and towns. Um, we um, we monitor footfall um, regularly on the, from the city centre. Um, the best way to, to um, analyse footfall is to look at it as a percentage of previous years. So um, it, we are seeing at the moment that footfall is tracking at roughly 80% of what it was like in 2019. Interestingly, obviously, it's, it's tracking at something like 180% of what it was last year. Yeah. Um, so. That's firstly that's that's the that's the best way to think about how we track footfall in, in our city, um, and then that percentage is what we then use to compare ourselves to other cities and other places around the, the country, um, and so we can see that the other places are also roughly tracking at about eighty percent of what would have normally been that figure before COVID. So we're able to benchmark ourselves against them in that way. So it doesn't matter if they have five million or five hundred thousand people a year. We can take it on that percentage because it's that norm. Bent, bent baseline that we're using. Um, the other thing that we do with footfall, which is quite interesting, is we look at a sort of monthly average. So we can see obviously what our busiest months are, and we can see what type of city and what type of place that makes us compared to others. So there's there's a sort of footprint that, that towns and places will have. Um, and 
you know, you don't need to be a, a kind of footfall analyst to understand that, you know, for, um, towns with high footfall in the summer are probably tourist towns and towns with high footfall consistently throughout the year are uh, fairly, um, they're, they're called comparison towns and they're, they're the towns where people go to shop from their local region. And it's that kind of data that we can look at um, and we analyse that, that consistently really at the City Council. And the report that we give you each year is, is a, a total figure, um, but it goes a lot deeper than that and we do spend quite a lot of time working on that. Would, would it be quite useful if maybe at our next meeting to have perhaps a brief report over, uh, about the footfall so that we can actually um, see what COVID, see post-COVID and that sort of thing, because it's so disjointed that really we don't, your explanation is brilliant, but we don't really see it in the actual document. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Chapes, do you want to? No, I mean, essentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, thanks, Helen, for the, for the answer. It was uh, uh, the other, I mean, the sort of, the other side of that coin, I guess, is, is the dwell time issue, isn't it? Because clearly we are, we are constantly looking at ways to get people not only to come to the city centre, but spend more time here. And much of what we've discussed earlier and, and on other occasions has been, you know, how do we get people not simply to, you know, it's the sort of, I know, I'm struggling to come up with, a, you know, it's popping to boots at lunchtime, rather than, you know, coming into the city centre and experiencing what, it, you know, what we have to offer and what potentially we have to offer in future years. Uh, and I think that that kind of data, if anything, the, the, the importance of it is becoming more and more underlined, isn't it, as we go on? Um, yes, yeah, certainly, and it's a really good question. Um, the, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely a key indicator of the success of a place, how long people stay in, stay in it and how much time they spend there. One of the um, developments we've had in the council in the last couple of years is we've now got new car parking data, and that allows us to be able to tell that. So um, I've, I've not done much analysis on it um, myself yet, but there's, um, there's more data that we can see now than we used to be able to. We used to be able to see that people had put £1.50 in the machine, and we didn't know how long they'd actually stayed. Um, but the data that we can get now tells us a bit more, gives us a bit cleverer, um, you know, tells us what time they've arrived or it tells us how long they've stayed, how many times that space has been used. So there, there's quite a lot of, of interesting data that you can get from that. Systems that you can, you can purchase as a council, which will give you some really in-depth data, but it comes with a really hefty price tag as well. Um, and, and so, you know, we haven't gone down that road in Worcester um, yet. Um, it may happen in the future. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to see the minor planning applications going back up. Um, and obviously, this is um, probably a few months ago, this data. Um, it's just that um, I hope it's going to continue. I want to thank the team, because we're obviously working very hard. But the reality is that I have got residents complaining about their planning application processes, you know, how long it is taking still. So um, I just want to encourage the team, actually, to see that shoot up from 20 something percent is great so thank you very much thanks chair i mean one answer to james's question is in the digital high street um uh, project which is on page 26 um and um you know one question may be well how is that progressing um and the because one of the apps that was supposed to be part of that was about as I understood, it was about um, measuring dwell time rather than anything else. Um, that's the digital high street Wi-Fi thing, which has been in the program now for about five or ten years, I believe. But that wasn't my question. That my question was: Can you remind us what the River Seven partnership thing is? It's a collection of partners that work around uh, developments for the Riverside. It's not met for a long time. Um, it's not met since I uh, joined the council, and I, I think it's been at least 18 months since it last met. Um, we are trying to find out if it is due to uh, meet up again, um, but we've not had a response yet. It's not led by us. It's led by county council and a number of other partners like Canals and Rivers Trust, and we tend to attend uh, to find out for the city centre, but we've not um, had any response from them recently. Um, but what is our contribution to it? 
because the, the measure is about our contribution, but if we don't know what the contribution is, other than turning up at meetings, it doesn't seem particularly fruitful. Yeah, it was, it was due to uh, do some fundraising and some applications for grant funding, but uh, they've been limited in what they've done, um, and it's been focused elsewhere or, or along the River Severn and not actually specifically around Worcester. So it's been negligible, uh, the, what we've actually gained from that partnership. We stayed in touch in case there were other opportunities um, and there were other funding applications that were being submitted that could potentially have a bigger impact for the city. But it, it's not had a huge uh, impact on us so far. Thanks, Chair. Just to follow on from the last point, I think it may be a different partnership, Adrian, but to answer Adrian's, I think it's about the whole of the River Severn. And so looking at how they manage um, the flow of water along the seven peak periods and, and what that would do if they could manage that slightly better in areas to mitigate the impact. But obviously, if you're mitigating impacts in one location, you might be accentuating the impact somewhere else. So obviously, that will speed on very carefully. But I don't think it's had a particular focus, I understand, around Worcestershire being more upstream than that, which is probably why there hasn't been any meetings relevant, relevant to Worcester City. Um, just on... Yeah, to, to manage manage the whole of the River Seven effectively. And I think they were looking at proposals that would uh, um, basically, uh, on the back of some proposals, much further north, uh, upstream the river, be able to manage the flow of water to there better that would potentially reduce the impact further downstream. But as we can see, if you put in interventions at part of the river, it will have an effect elsewhere. It didn't have any actions, as I understand, for, for Worcestershire, let alone for Worcester City. Um, but I think it's a fair point that Adrian is making about just because we're not having a meeting, that can't be just the action. It's got to be what, what's the partnership trying to achieve. But my question, Chair, was around these are all eminently sensible and good initiatives, but I wonder whether, particularly the ones around the high street and looking at you know digital high street uh, activities, empty shops, but I wonder where the opportunity to have a discussion about which ones uh, some analysis, I suppose, and discussion of which ones should we press in hard on, which are the future of the high street, which are the ones which, if we had an extra 100,000 to spend, we'd really want to invest in. Is it helping to bring more empty shops back into use? Is it the digital high street? Is it more um, activity? What's the future of, of, of high streets like Worcester um, if we want to get more people in there? No, noting that the change that's happened in terms of how people live and work is is more of a permanent change you know people are not going to the office every day of the week in every walk of life and so that will have an impact on the numbers of people visiting and um, that you know might be popping to boots or getting a sandwich or whatever so i just wonder where that opportunity is chair otherwise great as they are we're having a series of updates on a series of measures under ped but i think we might be missing where that where we should be really focusing within the report which are the ones which are the top two or three issues for us um, to regenerate the city and you know bring more people here and it's an it's an open question i don't know where the best forum for that is whether we could on one of these agenda items have an opportunity to have a more broad-based discussion based on some evidence some feedback of what's working what's not which would then inform a future plan or budgetary proposals for um, empty shops, that sort of thing, then I think we could, yeah, we could perhaps, I don't know, at our next meeting or something like that, a bit like we did with the um, empty properties, um, do it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very dry. If I may chair through, I'm, I'm grateful for the um, for the analogy because I think that that's that's absolutely what these committees should be doing when there's an opportunity is to take that scrutiny item, and officers should prepare for you. What are the opportunities? What are the issues? What are the levers? What are the funding streams? What's the art of the possible elsewhere? Um, and I think the the challenge then is: Are you looking for something that whets the appetite? In which case, we're doing that quite rapidly to a committee, I, I might venture to suggest 
uh, September instead of July, just um, in, just conscious of capacity. But if if it's if it then leads somewhere, then it's a question of okay, so what do we want to pursue, isn't it? And then where do you want to commission a bit more work? And that's where we may then want a small consultancy budget. So I think if we just spend a bit of time mapping out the art of the possible, levers, funding streams, who's doing what, and aim for that, then that would trigger that scrutiny discussion, wouldn't it? Which I think it would be we did ha find helpful on a previous item, yeah. And then we can sort of take it from there if further work's required. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask about the strategic play area development plan, because uh, I, I haven't seen much about it except this. I knew it existed, but that's about all. What age range is that covering, please? Through you, Chair. This came to committee, um, I'm going to say in March, um, sort of about that time. So there's obviously a full report there if you uh, want to delve into the detail. Um, it's for children and young people um, recognising that um, adolescents have different play requirements in, than children. And in fact, they don't want to call it play, but you know we have an obligation to provide. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the cap is. I'm, I'm going to, to venture to suggest it's 16, but I will confirm to you. I'm just delighted but to hear that those it's that children age range is included. It's young people, absolutely. And, and what the report identified was we have empirical evidence to support the view that many of our councillors shared when it was discussed that provision in, in, in pockets of the city is really strong and in other areas, particularly for young, um, young adults, young people, provision is not strong and we've got a, a, a noted, you know, notable deficit, particularly around some city centre play. So the committee discussed that at length. Where we are now is we don't have a development plan yet. We're commissioning the work and again, a meaningful consultation process to make sure that um, as, a, as a group of commissioners, our councillors can make the best decisions about funding in the future, instead of perhaps just reprovising what's gone before. It's um, the actual minutes are actually, we've just approved them um, earlier in this meeting. Um, and uh, it's, uh, if you, you, the actual document is, um, is um, at, at the meeting of the 5th, 14th of, of March. So you might, you might want to just uh, read the document as well and uh, see how much we, we've, um, we have, we're not yet there yet, but we're getting along. And I think that there's a, a um, at the next meeting there'll be a, there'll be an update. Um, any other questions? No. So um, that um, we note the Council's annual and quarter four performances for 2021-22. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So, oh, any, 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 any other first business? No. <laughs> Yeah, gosh, Helen, it's your last meeting. I didn't realise. <laughs> so, um, but just before you go, um, thank you very much to Helen. When do you when do when do you actually finish? Oh gosh. So, well, thank you very very much indeed for all your hard work and uh, support over the years. Um, our our loss and uh, Cheltenham's gain, I think. So, uh, thank you and uh, well done. Thanks, everyone.